NWP Radio. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. Welcome all to this special production of the National Writing Project. We're really excited about this feature series of NWP Radio called The Story of the Poem, where I have the chance to talk to poets about being a poet, the story behind a poem, and a craft feature of that poem. Each episode will end with an opportunity to give it a go. In other words, an invitation to craft a poem or a few lines using a technique the poet has highlighted. We hope these writing invitations will spur you to start or keep writing after this episode or give you something new to try in your classroom. I'm Tanya Baker, the Director of National Programs at the National Writing Project, and for each episode I'll have the honor and the pleasure of welcoming our guests and our listeners and viewers to spend a few minutes diving deep into poetry. Today's guest is George Ella Lyon. George Ella has published award-winning books for readers of all ages and her poem, Where I'm From, has been used as a model by teachers around the world and throughout the writing project. Recent titles of hers include She Let Herself Go, Poems, and the following picture books, Which Side Are You On? The Story of a Song and All the Water in the World, uh, The Pirate of Kindergarten, and You and Me and Home Sweet Home. Originally from the mountains of Kentucky, Lyon works as a freelance writer and teacher based in Lexington, where she lives with her husband, writer and musician Steve Lyon. They have two grown sons. George Ella, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Uh, we'd love to have you tell us a little bit about how and why you became a poet. I think I became a poet because my father read poems out loud when I was little, and I loved the sounds of those words. I loved the magic music and how they fit together, how they held emotion, how they created a spell. Even if I didn't understand, if I couldn't have told you what they were about, because these were poems for grown-ups. I could have told you what it felt like to be in those poems. Mm. And I just felt like, oh, that's, that's where I want to be. Um, and so when I was about nine or 10 in third grade, and I had an experience where I, the feeling was just too big, it was too big for me. And I sat down and, uh, and wrote a poem and, uh, I knew a person could do that because I'd, I'd, I'd heard them. And it was a wonderful, um, it was a wonderful experience doing that. And I like to sing too, and I, I still love to sing, but this was something, this was something different. This was the, the music was in the words. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that sort of was my beginning on the path of making poems. Um, and it's been my root wad, I guess you could say. That's really lovely. And I love that this seminal experience was when you were in third or fourth grade. It's fantastic. There's been a lot of talk from other poets too in this series about becoming a poet because their parents read poems. I love it. Um, you've brought us a poem to talk about today. Um, I believe you're going to talk about your poem, uh, The Trimates. Is that how you right. pronounce that? <laughs> um, could you read it for us? Sure. Uh, it's in this book, Voices of Justice. And um, since I can't turn the screen upside down, I'll have to <laughs> from the book. The Trimates, Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey. Barute Galdakas. Three young women set out across the world to Tanzania, Rwanda, Borneo to learn all they could about chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans. They hiked, climbed, and waded through rainforests, mountains, swamps, watching, mapping, reaching, discovering, 
teaching, fighting for the lives of the primates who cannot survive unless their habitats thrive too. These three scientists shared a mentor, Louis Leakey, who called them the trimates. And try they did, not only in the field, they wrote about their findings to give people far away a glimpse of the beauty of these creatures in their homeland. They gave speeches to raise money to support the rescue, not only of the primates, but their habitats too. Though Fossey has died, her legacy continues. Goodall and Galdacos labor on. The trimates work makes clear that to save wild creatures, our love must be for life, not power, not money. That's what will save chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans. That's what will save us and the whole round world. Oh, George Ella. That was beautiful. And coincidentally, I'm working on this other project of teaching science. And um, we're just getting ready to do a whole unit on women scientists and, and starting with Jane Goodall. So I was, I, this poem fell into my lap at such a perfect moment. Can you tell us the story of this poem? How did it come to be? Well, uh, it came to be because of this book, uh, the book idea, which was not mine. It originated with uh, the editor, Christian Trimmer at Holt Books for Young Readers. And he approached my agent, Brenda Bowen, looking for somebody to write this book. Uh, I was already working on a book of poems about peacemakers and um, but the editor who had been interested uh, in the end didn't like it uh, or her acquisitions committee didn't like it or whatever. Anyway, so, uh, so Brenda sent Christian those sample poems. Um, one of them actually wound up in the book uh, and he felt like I could, could uh, do this. So they already had a list of people that they wanted, they were suggesting could be in here. So they asked me to make a list and together we sorted out. So they got some, I got some. Um, and uh, cutting it down to 18 was very difficult. Of course, in this poem, we get three people. So that's, uh, <laughs> that just counts as one. It's a, it's a, you know, triple wordplay. <laughs> right, yes, exactly. Uh, but so, so that we both wanted this. We both wanted them. Uh, I didn't know that much about Barute Galdacas. Yeah, um, I didn't either. Yeah, and uh, as I began, then, then came the research, um, which I, I love doing, you know, I'm, Research is so much more e easy than writing, you know? <laughs> I think that too. You know, I know how to do that. <laughs> writing is another thing. But, um, and it was fascinating. There's so much available um, uh, film and interviews and, uh, and of course they're writing and writing about them um, and books for children about them. And uh, anyway, so I had this huge, um, amount of material. And uh, the thing that, uh, yeah, so I had all these notes and I did not know uh, where to begin. So I looked for patterns um, and I began to think about what, what Begin, what was catching my eye was the threeness of it. Mm. There are three women, there are three different places, there are three different 
primates. Mm -hmm. uh, so I began looking for other threes, three different uh, types of land, uh, three different activities they were doing. Um, so, so I began to have that litany of threes. Nice. Um, and, but I, I didn't know how to shape it, mm -hmm. um, you know, beyond that and how to, for it not to be prosy mm -hmm. um, and not to just feel like research, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and then I got to a draft that ended the whole round world. And when those words showed up, this illumination hit me that the poem wanted to be round. And it was like, oh my goodness. I was <laughs> thrilled and put on notice that how in the world <laughs> that? And um, so, you know, so then it moved to another stage of the process. Um, and I'll be showing, I'll be yes. showing. Uh, I knew I was done. It's a feeling thing. Mm -hmm. Just like when I came to that, the whole round world, I knew that was the end of the poem. I mean, I mm -hmm. knew it's, it, it, it felt like, oh, this is where the poem was going all along. Mm -hmm. And that didn't mean I was done with the poem, but that meant the poem had been, had arrived where it was mm -hmm. going. Because emotionally, the way it hit me, mm -hmm. I, I knew that. Um, I knew I was, um, when I had made the shape and it, the bait, the the essential information was there, and the rhythm it was held in that rhythm mm -hmm. and was still shapely. Then I felt, again, I felt by reading it out loud and reading it out loud, till it felt right, till it sounded right. I really, I really write by ear. Um, I had. Uh, visual problems as a kid mm. I saw two of everything Ooh. till I was 13 oh my goodness yeah that's where the pirate of kindergarten came that little girl <laughs> level two uh, so I became a listener mm -hmm. which really uh, helped me become a writer you know because I I listened to the music the, the rhythm and the music Plus I read everything twice, mm. you know, so that, that helped too. But my ear really tells me things my eye won't see. I understand that. I've been having a lot of conversations because I think I also am an oral listener or reader. Like I, and I, when we started really doing all of this work on helping children read by, you know, visualize the text or all of these things, I, I was always like, but I, you know, I can visualize, that's true. But what I really, what really moves me is like hearing the text and the sound of people's voices and the words they choose. And yeah. I want to point out two really inter other interesting things that you said, Georgella, for um, the way they kind of sit differently than people might expect. One is um, you talked a lot about research and the joy of the research process of this. And I think in schools, often we save the research process for children to write informational texts. But this, you are, you know, you're showing us an example of um, doing research that will eventuate in a poem. And I think we don't see that very often in, in school places anyway. Um. I think that um, there's such there's such creativity in what they did and how they did it. 
and how they shape their lives and their determination, their vision, Mm -hmm. um, that it's, it's so inspiring. Um, I, I found it very, you know, I found it very exciting and um, I, I love to read about other people's yeah. process. And I don't see that as, it doesn't have to be our artistic process, you know, right. what we call artistic. Um, I'm fascinated by how people make their way and, and mm-hmm. live, live out their vision. Yeah, me too. I think the other thing that might have surprised people in that story of this poem is they might see this poem published in this book and assume it had always been around. And I think we're going to talk more about that next, but I just point out that it was a ways into the process before this poem found its shape. Yeah. Yeah. So before we get to hear that story of how the poem, more about that, how the poem found its shape, um, I think it would be lovely to just hear it again, if that's all right with you. Sure, sure. And you'll hear more of the threeness. I mean, I think that- I think I will. That's what I'm imagining that I will hear. The Trimates, Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, Maru Take All the Falls. Three young women set out across the world to Tanzania, Rwanda, Borneo, to learn all they could about chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans. They hiked, climbed, and waded through rainforests, mountains, swamps, watching, mapping, reaching, discovering, teaching, fighting for the lives of the primates who cannot survive unless their habitats thrive too. These three scientists shared a mentor, Louis Leakey, who called them the trimates. And try they did, not only in the field, they wrote about their findings to give people far away a glimpse of the beauty of these creatures and their homelands. They gave speeches to raise money to support the rescue, not only of the primates, but their habitats too. Though Fossey has died, her legacy continues. Goodall and Galdakos labor on. The trimates work makes clear that to save wild creatures, our love must be for life not power, not money. That's what will save chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans. That's what will save us and the whole round world. Indeed, the poem I hadn't noticed ends with three words. Yes, there's that too, yeah. There's so many threes and that one I hadn't noticed. Uh, thank you, Georgella. So I think what I'm going to do now is stop sharing because you are going to talk about how the poem got crafted into the shape that it did. Okay. We're going to do that by switching slide decks. So tell us about how I, this poem turned out round. <laughs> okay. Um, so we can see it full screen. Yes. Should I start here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Okay, uh, so this you can see from the number four up in the right le- the right corner. This is like the fourth typed draft. I, I couldn't find the handwritten ones, so. Um, but you can see I'm 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 noticing the threeness mm-hmm. there, the three places. Yeah, the three uh, primates that hiked, climbed, and waded rainforests mountain so I'm noticing that and I'm and I'm also revising as I go um, but I do and I've got the whole round world uh, at the bottom but mm-hmm. I have still haven't um, 
I just said that that helped me see that it had to be round, but I guess I didn't see it yet. So <laughs> it was the moment that I saw it, but when I look back, evidently. Oops. And if you if you looked at the, I mean, if you compared the text, there are a whole lot of things that are very different and things that aren't in there yet. Mm -hmm. So you can go to the next one. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you can see I'm starting to divide it up to think if I, if I do, uh, if I do try to make it round, what might go, uh, how the lines mm -hmm. might break up. So I guess I did, I guess I did uh, get the round idea from the previous draft. And I'm counting words too. You can see the 80 over yes. there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, that, that slide is too soon. I guess these are not in the perfect order. Uh, <laughs> because here I was just trying to space it out. I felt, I felt it needed space, but I hadn't gotten to the round part yet. Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, but this did not work. There was too much air in it. It yeah. just like, uh, like the words were kind of loose floating around mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. uh, here I'm marking it off. Mm. Uh, here I decided to try the round thing and I yeah. I got a dinner plate. <laughs> I got a big post-it note and a dinner plate. And as you can see, I <laughs> I didn't do great uh, doing making it uh, close to the um, <laughs> round, but um, it was pretty. It was pretty crazy doing that. And I, you can't. I don't know if you can see, but I did have to erase a whole bunch to try to make it fit. I do see. Yeah. <laughs> and the, I'll show you in a minute. Um, the The plan for the book was that. There would be a painting, an illustration, on a portrait of the person on the left, and yeah. my poem on the right. I was not supposed to take up my poem was not supposed to be on both pages. Right. <laughs> so when I began to do this work, I had to go to the editor and ask for a dispensation, uh, and so I had to send him uh, a photo of this. Mm -hmm. and so um, I hate to tell you, but <laughs> this is what I, this is the poem. <laughs> and he, uh, and he sent it to Jennifer, uh, who was wonderful enough, Jennifer M. Potter, who was wonderful enough to say, okay. Um, and I did it in brown ink and green ink for the, uh -huh. earth, the um, and the growing things and and uh, and of course here it is uh, and I'll show you in a minute one of the intermediary stages of uh, design uh, and illustration but I did want to show you um, another poem that wound up taking a shape I never dreamed it would. Oh, yeah. And I think it was about 1992. I visited Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water mm -hmm. with my family. And it's pretty stunning. Have you ever been there? I haven't, but yeah. I've um, seen pictures of it. Yeah, well, it's just, it's just astonishing. And um, and of course the waterfall that comes out from under the house, then it goes, it, it comes around as you can see in this photo and then it goes way down uh, beyond what you can see. It keeps dropping. Oh. After you go through the house, um, you can hike on down to the waterfall, down below the, you know, keep following the water and then you can look back up and see the house. And it's, oh. it's beautiful. Well. It was fall when we went there 
and we were hiking down to the waterfall and I fell. Uh, and it really hurt when I fell, but I thought it was hilarious because I fell at falling water. <laughs> I fell at waterfall and it was fall. <laughs> writer, so I was falling writer at falling water, falling in the fall. <laughs> anyway, so I began writing this poem. Uh, and like the poem about the trimates, it would not, uh, I, I couldn't be satisfied with it. I had it, mm -hmm. in, I had it in two line stanzas because I thought it would be like the, the, the striated rocks you see in the chimney. Right, that, yes. And also some, somewhat like the, uh, the beautiful uh, cantilevered uh, balconies that come out, supports that come out, uh, roofs that come out. I thought it could be like that. Well, that didn't work at all. And then I realized, oh my God, it wants to look like falling water. Ah, uh, it did uh, want to look like that. Yeah. Now, who can I get to talk me out of this? <laughs> and this was a long time ago. I had no, no idea. I mean, the computer couldn't do it, not in any program I had. I had to cut up the words. Oh. Page, which was like, a, you know, like the, I had to be an architect. Yeah. Uh, and the word stuck to my fingers. <sighs> and it was just so much fun and so hard and hilarious. <laughs> but anyway, here's what it looks like. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. So if I, I couldn't get it published forever because nobody, it didn't, <laughs> you know, they just didn't accommodate it. Right. Uh, and finally, it was done as a broadside by a letterpress. It's but, beautiful. But it is. It is beautiful. They did a wonderful job, and and the person who set the type could still see. They got someone very young. <laughs> <laughs> do it. But, um, but anyway, it's uh, I just wanted to show you another I wanted to share another example. I okay. think that's great. Okay, so that's my little slideshow. We can I go love back. it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, while I change screens. I wonder if you want to go back to the poem and read it for us one more time now that we have had the opportunity to see um, the stages of how it got to look like it looks. Okay, can I show you this one other thing that I, I don't have a I don't have a slide for but I'll just show it to you when you yes screen. Yeah, do share it. Show it now while we're we can see you big. Oh, okay. Um, this is the first draft of the illustration. Oh, it's so different. Yes, with with uh, the trimates and their primates in the middle. Right. And I, again, you know, the author is not supposed to have so make comments. <laughs> and uh and for the most part you know i never do but i really saw this and thought that that middle is that's the source right um and um either either there's either it's in, either it's empty or it's this or it's power right um and so jennifer said actually that was sort of what she had thought at the first it, that had been her original impulse but then she had done this so i i think it's so beautiful um the way she did it it's just it's perfect it is it's yeah. beautiful so, okay, one more time. One more time, if the you don't mind. No, I'm happy. The Trimates, Jane Goodall, 
Diane Fossey, Berute Galdikas. Three young women set out across the world to Tanzania, Rwanda, Borneo, to learn all they could about chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans. They hiked, climbed, and waded through rainforests, mountains, swamps, watching, mapping, reaching, discovering, teaching, fighting for the lives of the primates who cannot survive unless their habitats thrive too. These three scientists shared a mentor, Louis Leakey, who called them the primates, and try they did. They wrote about their findings to give people far away a glimpse of the beauty of these creatures and their homelands. They gave speeches to raise money to support the rescue, not only of the primates, but their habitats too. Though Fossey has died, her legacy continues. Goodall and Galdakas labor on. The trimates work makes clear that to save wild creatures, our love must be for life, not power, not money. That's what will save gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzees. That's what will save us and the whole round world. Thank you, Georgella. I feel like this was so illuminating, this whole conversation and the two examples of poems that find their shapes. I realize in that third reading that it's almost impossible for me to imagine this poem as anything but round and also round with like the sun or this powerful force in the center of it. So um, how lucky for us to see how it got to be like that. Cause sometimes you think things just happen but they don't, they are made to happen. <laughs> Yeah, it's very, uh, it's, it's mysterious to me. And I, I love that. And I love being able to work with people who are willing to trust that. Yeah. You know, that's what you hope for any picture book that, that in the end, you can't separate. Right. The illustration yeah. and the word. Yeah, you have so much experience. I don't have a lot of experience with the making of picture books. That's probably a story for another day. Before I let you go, I would love for you to offer a provocation or an invitation or an inspiration for uh, poets listening to us today. What would you invite them to do? Well, one thing I would suggest is uh, even in your journal uh, that you play with, that you be playful, that you let your words just uh, go where they want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, um, because for me, I think that's one of the reasons that it's easy or, or, or it seems natural to me to explore the shape of a poem because I do that in my journal. Like, like here's an example. Oh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see it bigger. Can you see that? Oh, I can, yes. Oh, this is beautiful. And I, I often put other things like feathers. feathers. I love this journal because it's made from an old record album. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, here's another, here's another example. Oh yeah. But if you're, if you're working on a poem and you don't, uh, You're, you're stuck, you know, either because you um, you don't know, you haven't even got a whole draft and you don't know where to go next, or you've got a whole draft, but you're not satisfied, but you don't know why. Um, first of all, read it aloud. I mean, I read everything aloud. And uh, I can tell when my voice goes flat. Mm. Uh, or if I speed up because I'm trying to get over something real fast, so I won't notice how it does. <laughs> you know, it's like there's plywood and here's the parquet and here's the plywood. 
Uh, so then look at the poem or listen to the poem and see maybe you've all, you maybe you've got it in a square shape you know mm -hmm. maybe it wants shorter lines mm. maybe it wants more air in it maybe it wants two line stanzas maybe it wants long lines maybe it wants maybe there's something in the in the subject of the poem that suggests some some other form, some shape. Um, and you can always go back if it doesn't work. You know, you can have, you can have, po I, di I did this recently with a poem and I thought I could, I'd take it to my poets group and they would tell me right away if it was, <laughs> it didn't work at all. But so I had, I had four, four line stanzas, but they were one was here, one was here, one was here, one was here. And you really could read them this way and then this way or this way and then this way. Um, so it was sort of a, a multiple option poem. Yeah. They, they got that. I, and, but I thought they might think, yeah, we get it, but it's a gimmick, <laughs> you know, but, but they didn't feel that way. Um, so you know, you can write a poem, you can just have some words in one corner, some words in one corner, in the other corner. Um, you can, your words can be all just in the middle. I mean, you can think of your poem as a sculpture with the white space around it, like the white space around a sculpture and mm -hmm. play with your poem that way and see, you know, feel it as a dimensional thing. Mm. For me, um, it it doesn't work, or it's only ever worked once. If I thought of the shape to begin with, mm. then it's like I'm forcing it. Yeah, you know, it it it's much better if it dawns on me after I've already, you know, been working on it, and then it right. seems to come organically out of out of the poem. Like I'm really desperate by the time I get the <laughs> it seems possible. Um, but there's a wonderful book called uh, Art and Fear, uh, the Perils and uh, the Perils and Joys of Art Making um, by David Bales and Ted Orland. I can, I can send you this. But anyway, one of the things they say that's so helpful to me is that um, making art is about a relationship between you and the thing being made, and you both have to be free to move. Ah, that's lovely. Yeah, and so you have to let what you're making change. I mean, it may turn out that it doesn't want to be a poem at all. Mm. You know, it might really want to be a song. It might want to be a dialogue. Yeah. It might be a story. Uh, and so, so you might change your, uh, you might have to change what your expectations because you have to, it's not just you making something, something's emerging. And so you pay attention to it in the way you would to someone you were talking to. Right. And I, so I think that's, I think that's helpful, but, but keeping that play element, mm -hmm. you know, is just, is so important because there's this, there's this uh, PBS, it was on PBS series called the United States of Poetry. Mm -hmm. It begins with this guy saying, if it ain't a pleasure, it ain't a poem. <laughs> and you know no matter the, you know no matter the weight of the matter of the poem there's that pleasure of yeah. the sound of the rhythm that that catches our heartbeat and our breathing of the song of the of the music in the poem of the way it integrates our physical and emotional and spiritual being, you know, all of that. And, uh, and remember that pumps can be funny. Right. You know, yeah. so, you know, goof around. <laughs> you, know, you, 
can be, uh, there's just so much room. Right. You know? So that's play. lovely. That's a lovely place for us to, I feel like those are all sort of non-schoolish writing advice and a lovely place for us to stop. Okay. Uh, Georgella, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to have your work in form and infuse and delight us in the writing project. Um, yeah. We're huge fans and we're thankful for the opportunity to get this insight into your, into your work. Thank you. Thank you. NWP Radio. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP.